have it accessible to anybody who wasn't able to join from the beginning um, and just access these wonderful uh, questions that we're gonna go over today. So I believe we're up and running and we can get started. So I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Lauren Hensley and I am the Director of Program Strategy for the Nashville Technology Council. And I'm joined on the call today by the other members of the Sales and Biz Dev Peer Group Planning Committee. That's made up of Amanda Banks, Rob Wilson, Matt Frederick, and Don Ostell. So thank you to the Planning Committee for putting together this program today. Um, we've got a lot of content to cover, some great panelists here, and I'll turn it over to our moderator in just a moment. But I do wanna call out that there will be a Q&A portion later on in the call. So if any of you attendees have questions that you'd like the panelists to answer, please feel free to drop that into the Q&A section. I'll keep an eye on that during the call. Um, and when we turn it over to that portion of the program, we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce today's um, moderator. We are excited to have Craig Eggleton here. He is the CEO and founder of Sales Bullpen. Um, and we're just thrilled to have his perspective today as moderator, as someone who began his career as an entry-level sales rep and then quickly climbed the ranks of several notable global um, corporations and organizations. We know that he has a lot of great relevant experience and insight to today's topic of discussion. So I will go ahead and turn everything over to you, Craig, and we can get started with the discussion. Awesome. Well, Thank you, Lauren, and all the folks uh, that are part of the uh, Sales and Business Development Peer Group. That's a mouthful to say at nine o'clock in the morning. So this is always exciting anytime I get to spend time with, with you folks and, and talk about sales and business development. Um, I'm excited about our panel this morning. Uh, you guys have put together quite the group and no pressure on Tom, Sharon, and John. So we've, we've raised the bar here pretty, pretty high. So um, Real quick, I want to take a minute. Uh, Sharon Asmus, Asmus sorry, uh, is we're lucky enough to have her join us. Sharon, could you give us a 30 second, one minute bio of, of, of yourself, please? Uh, certainly. Currently, I uh, lead the data services group of Core Civic. And so, if you're not familiar with Core Civic, uh, that is a private uh, prison and detention facility provider. Um, in addition to halfway houses. So I oversee all of the data and applications that we use to run that business. And prior to that, I worked for Ryman Hospitality, property is their head of IT, and for Gaylord Entertainment, overseeing their applications that they use to run the Gaylord Hotels as well. And my prior background is in data and analytics. I'm glad to Very be here, looking forward to your questions. Ah, we're glad to have you. Very impressive experience. And uh, John Anderson, John, share a little bit with us about yourself, please. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Anderson. I'm with Resource Communications Group, or RCG. Uh, I'm one of the partners. We are a provider of telecom department as a service. Uh, essentially, we go into uh, large enterprise IT shops, and we bolt onto them as a fully functioning telecom department for hire or in a, as a service mode. Um, I am a, a small business owner. And so that makes me a, a seller and a buyer at the exact same time. So hopefully I can uh, leverage that in, in some way positive for this conversation. And being a small business owner, I imagine you're a janitor and a cook from time to time as well. So a little, little bit of everything. Yes, sir. Very cool. And last but not least, uh, Tom Mitchell. Tom, share with the group a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, sure. I am president and COO of a company called In Sequence, and we sell software solutions to tier one, primarily automotive manufacturers globally. So we, we work globally, and I get approached globally on, um, from sales and marketing professionals. Uh, my background is heavy in marketing, so I've sat in the seat that many of the attendees are sitting. Um, Prior to taking this role, I uh, ran strategy and VP at different healthcare companies for a number of years and branched out in the last five, six years to do something a little bit different. Uh, so I understand the challenges and the needs that a lot of this group has and the pressures they're under. So I look forward to sharing some experiences. 
Tom, I think I noticed something on your bio that said thinking, you, you like to think fast, you like to think forward. There was, I'm missing a piece there. What yeah, I guess. so one of the things and, and something I feel strongly about, uh, think forward, think fast, act now. And so you kind of put that together, think through things strategically, but move through them quickly. You know, if you, if you wait too long, you know, time, time wounds all, all deals, basically, if you think yeah. about it. Way you think in the way I think about it anyway. So you have to move quickly, especially in this environment. Yeah, good kid. Well, with that as my cue, I better move quickly or we're going to run out of time. So and that um, so um, so here's an interesting statistic I, I've I've read over the past several years. But before a um, before a sales rep even enters the discussion. 60% uh, of the buying decision has been made by a lot of corporations. And that number just stuck out to me to think as a sales rep or even from a marketing perspective that by the time I get engaged in the conversation, over half the decisions already been made. So I am curious, thinking back about some of the existing relationships um, uh, that have been established with your company, what have, uh, what have sales reps done to position themselves um, in a favorable light with your company, some, some creative things or maybe some things that have stuck out to you. And, and Tom, I'll start with you if, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think the, the ability to listen and to, you know, to a need is one thing and understanding timing is another thing. So, you know, when, uh, when we explore new, new solutions we need or new partners we need to engage, engage with. It might not be, it might not be that we need today, but we're thinking through some strategy we have in the future. So understanding that from a timing perspective, understanding what our need is and not assuming that, um, and not assuming that you understand what the solution we might need is um, until you fully engage with us. Sharon, how about you? No, I've, I'd like to start out and explain a little bit about my vendor management or, or vendor partnership approach, uh, because I think that's kind of a, a good basis for this question and, and perhaps the other questions that you have. Um, I, you know, there's, uh, there's upwards of, you know, 75 to 100 different providers uh, currently with the organization um, that I work with. And what I try to do is identify our strategic partners and platforms that we go to before we make the decisions and make sure that we're doing the regular quarterly business review and openly sharing um, information about the projects that we're working on. I had a great example a couple weeks ago during a quarterly business review, there was a capability that we were looking for and we had no idea that this existing partner offered that service. And so it was a great way to get them engaged in the RFP process. So uh, my, my approach is really focusing on uh, what we identify as strategic partners and making sure that we have regular conversations with them about what we're doing. Sharon, are those, uh, those QBRs, are they typically, uh, when you're managing 75 different types of relationships, are those QBRs initiated by your team or are, the, are your vendors initiating those reviews? So we're, we're only doing those with our strategic partners. So maybe the okay. top, top 10. And uh, we are initiating those. Uh, sometimes our partners initiate them. Uh, certainly, since I'm new to Core Civic in October, uh, it, you know my philosophy is a little bit different. So we're we're restarting those regular conversations just because it's important as we grow to make sure we understand if the partners we have are aligned with what we are trying to do based on our three to five year outlook. Okay couple of nuggets there I want to hit back on in a second. John, how about that same question to you, thinking about those relationships? Um... Yeah, for, for whether I'm acting as a small business owner buyer or a part of our professional services actually acting as vendor management uh, for our clients. And the biggest thing that I look for is the ability to differentiate. 
Um, when I get a list of superlatives, we're better, good, great, awesome. None of that is meaningful. Um, if, if I'm approaching from a criteria oriented decision-making process towards a vendor, I have to have that vendor come back to me with differentiation, with the ability to say, this is what we do well, bad, poor, great. Uh, without that, I cannot match criteria to a potential lender. So this is always on the minds, I think, of, of, our, of our sales people and even from a marketing perspective. Um, how do each of you like to be approached um, by a vendor? I know it's kind of a loaded question, but um, what are some things that vendors do that, um, Sharon, I think you were talking about there was a solution that was brought to you that you didn't even know that somebody offered, but what are things that people do that pique your interest and, and get you engaged? And I'll, I'll start with you, Sharon. So I do want to differentiate between existing partnerships and new partnerships. And I know you'll ask questions later potentially about you know, a new uh, partnership or more of a cold call. So I won't talk about that right now, but for existing partnership, I, I really try to be as open as possible, but typically we identify kind of the vendor owner or the vendor manager. And that's the single point of contact for the, um, the vendor ideally. That's the person uh, coordinating the QBRs and having uh, the daily or regular contact. Uh, sometimes that's me, sometimes that's someone on my team. Um, and, and what I like is for, for, for partners who really get, spend time, um, potentially not with me, but uh, just online, getting to know my business and talking to me about the business challenges and the business needs, and then proactively bringing solutions to me or us based on um, the needs and, and really in a way that um, is, is not, um, not sales related, but uh, trying to help us solve a problem. So for example, I did have one vendor send me a note and say, hey, th this free software is available for, for you to use. This is a sample of what it does. Let's schedule um, a, an hour uh, intro demo. And so, you know, it's not necessarily a sales benefit, but it's a benefit to us in establishing that partnership and trust is important. Yeah. All really good points. Uh, Tom, how about, how about you on that same question from a preference from how, how do you like to be approached? And we'll look at this more from, um, let's, we'll talk about the cold side of it in a second, but think about the existing uh, vendor relationships that you have, what, and what are some things that they do that demonstrate to you they've done their homework? Yeah, so from an existing vendor perspective, um, again, you know, a lot of times we, once, once we have a partner in place, we might go to them and say, hey, we need to add this functionality Do you have it. How can you help us solve this problem? And again, it comes down to them listening and coming back with a solution that makes sense for us. Uh, you know, might not be cost specific, you know, information, but rather functionality that we're looking for. And then enabling us, like, like uh, Sharon was saying, uh, providing a, a you know, we sell software, so we understand that, but you know, getting a demo of, of what the solution is, if it's a software solution, if it's a business management type solution, looking at it from an ROI perspective, um, but getting that information uh, concisely, getting it to us in, in the time that we need it, uh, and making sure it's real clear to understand what the, you know, what the benefits are. Um, I always believe in value selling, so I want to understand what the value is. What I preach to my uh, my sales team here is let's let's sell value. But what's the value back to us when we're working with existing partner? And I think existing partners have an advantage because they they typically work with us. For instance, right now that we are implementing a brand new phone system, we've hosted our own phone system for a number of years. 
we're moving that to the cloud and working with an, an outside party to do that. And as we've gone through the evaluation process and the implementation process, we looked at and our call center needed some functionality that that wasn't set up properly in the in the first setup. And, and we're going through testing, so it's okay. But the um, sales executive said, look, I really don't understand what you're needing. Let me bring in our in-house consultant. And, and so they listened, brought that person in and helped us understand and, and kind of stratify what we needed without wasting a lot of time. So I found that a value from hearing that you know, back from our IT team that, hey, they got it resolved quickly. Uh, the vendor was listening. So that, that's how I prefer, you know, our, our teams to engage with. John, how about some additional thoughts or anything you want to add to that? Yeah, the um, the kind of table stakes thing, they have to know what they're talking about. They have to be able to address, they have to be able to differentiate, they have to be able to address a problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, one thing that I'm a huge fan of that uh, is a little maybe unorthodox, um, community involvement. If there is a, um, a vendor, a company, a partner, a uh, potential partner for one of my clients that I'm evaluating, and I see that they're involved in uh, community projects, giving back to the NTC, um, I will gravitate towards those. And so you use the term approach, and I've um, over the years built some really great relationships, uh, doing things for the community, being involved in programs, committees, um, boards. That has always been something that I feel like is poorly done potentially, um, if not properly balanced, it can come across as cheesy or overt. Uh, but if I see someone that actually cares about what it is that they're involved in, and it's something that I care about as well, it's a great place to make a connection. Um, and approachability goes through the roof in those environments. You know, it's interesting as I'm just sitting here listening and observing some of the, the things that you guys are each describing, I, I like to think about as traits that I see in some of like the, the best partners, the best salespeople. And I haven't heard anything where you guys have said, you know, people that I respond to are the loudest, the most over the top, the cheesiest, the whatever. And but the things that I'm hearing are you, you're, you, you uh, are talking, the people that mean the most to you, those partnerships that mean the most are the ones that sell value, that differentiate, to understand your needs. Um, that share some things in common, right? And, and I think those are one of the things that I think we miss a lot if we were to go back and say, hey, what is it about these relationships that I have uh, that, I, that I can't live without? What makes them so valuable? And I think as we've talked to maybe even some of our younger, even, um, even our more senior sales reps, taking that time to think about the things that are valuable to our clients and thinking but with any outreach we have, Am I bringing something of value to this person? Um, and not to get on too much of a sidetrack, I won't throw too many curveballs out here, but it is interesting. And, and each of you have hit on this a little bit, but um, there, are, there are triggers that kind of happen along the way that cause prospective buyers to be engaged. And I think the challenge that we all have is in the sales environment is status quo, I think is still the number one um, thing that we have to get through. Um, but I mentioned 60% of the buying has already happened before sales reps gotten involved. So people are actively searching for a solution, but there's also this thing called the window of dissatisfaction. I don't know if anybody's on the panel's heard of this, um, but there are some things that I'm sure can cause each of you to be in that window of dissatisfaction. It could be, hey, I'm upset with an existing partnership I have. Um, Tom or Sharon, I think one of you brought up that, hey, a vendor brought something to our attention that we didn't even know we needed to have potentially. So there's that awareness um, or there's change. And I think with each of your organizations, there's constantly some change or transitioning happening. So, um, so this is a question, I promise you. I'm just setting the table here a little bit. This window is dissatisfaction. There's things that our sales reps can do to make them the emotional favorite during that. So I'm, I'm trying to think of when you're thinking back, maybe to when each of you have been in that window of dissatisfaction, maybe there's change, you're not happy with the current um, vendor or partner. 
have uh, thinking back when you've made a change, have there been things, and you've probably already covered this a little bit, that maybe that a new provider have done that have really set them up as kind of that emotional favorite when you made that change? Did that make any sense at all how I set that question up? Sharon, I, I'll go with you. I, I think I understand the question, but help, help steer, steer me in the right direction there. So, you know, it, from my perspective, it is so much harder to, to change partners than it is to um, work on making a strong partnership with the partners you have. Yeah. And so I only have a very few examples of where you get to the point of dissatisfaction that, that you're going back to the market and looking for a replacement. In those cases, when we did that, we typically, you know, just based on the formality of the organization do a very structured and formal RFP process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for the most part, we traditionally rely on Gartner Magic Quadrant um, or uh, other mm -hmm. tools like that Forrester to help us identify the vendors that we should evaluate. Tom, how about, how about you thinking uh, on that same approach? Um, I know change is pretty, you know, especially with existing partnerships, change, if we can avoid it, so much the better if we can continue getting that uh, service from our existing partnerships. But have there been some times where you've had the change where somebody has really positioned themselves to be that person in the wings, so to speak? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the change of, a, of our, our payroll and our HR system uh, a few years ago, as you know, that's pretty painful change in many cases. And uh, we, you know, we have about, at, at that time we had about 80 employees so it was vital and, and um, it was vital that when we made that change, we made that change because we felt like we were dealing with a little bit of an antiquated and pragmatic solution and, and provider. And so someone who could, who could help us overcome that dis dissatisfaction and help us think forward into where we were going, uh, specifically as we were putting more people on the continent in Europe, at that time, how we're going to manage that, um, finding the right partner to, to do that. And again, I, I think Sharon mentioned kind of an a RFP process. We didn't necessarily go through an RFP process, but we, we uh, had networked with uh, potential, a couple of potential providers we looked at and went out and explore, explored. And again, they knew the time when we did that, the time of change was not right then. We were timing it for the beginning of a new year which made a lot of sense for us. And um, in that window of dissatisfaction, we, we gave the existing vendor all the opportunity to help solve our problems. And they kind of kept going back to, to today's need, not the future need. And we narrowed it down. It was with two vendors that could help us address the future need we had because they were listening to, to what we were saying as opposed to trying to, to come into a defensible position and already have an argument against, you know, or, or why, you know, overcoming our objection, I guess you could say, they were in, in, in that, like I said, defensible position in, in handling our objection instead of helping us tr try to solve a true need. And that's, that's, you know, that window of dissatisfaction closed quickly for us, especially with our, our HR manager when she was saying, hey, she kind of threw her hands up and say, okay, I, I'm done with them. Let's narrow it down to these two. And, you know, we obviously went with one of those two. Yeah, great insight, that John. Well, oh, I I was feverishly taking down notes. So from from both of you guys, John, how about you? Yeah, I've been in scenarios like that, and the um, say it's a mistake, a problem, something broken. Um, transparency number one is is uh, a requirement, a must. When uh, a vendor, a partner has an issue fess up and or mess up and fess up they come they they have a clear understanding of of what the problem is and what they've done um and so that transparency is is just it it has to happen the uh second piece of it is accountability 
um, if a if a partner can explain to me how they're going to work themselves out of the problem, uh, we drop the ball. We're going to pick it back up, and here are the steps that we're going to take to get to the end resolution that we've discussed. If I can if I can see that, then the third thing I'm going to look for is that consistency. If they can actually deliver, or even if they make mistakes, if it's consistent in their approach, and I see that those improvements are being made, that that transparency and accountability is being offered up and that consistency is being shown, then they're going to work me out of a dissatisfaction window. Gotcha. Laura, do we have, what did we have, about five more minutes before we get to the, the chat questions? Yeah, I'd say we have time for one more prepared question and then we'll move over to the Q&A. I better make this a good one, guys. It's our last one. So let's see here. It was dangerous. You guys gave me the opportunity here to ask whatever question I wanted. So I'm going to go to um, how would you guide someone in crafting? This is a really thought out question here and crafting an appropriate, thoughtful, inoffensive approach. So how would you guide someone in crafting a thoughtful, inoffensive, appropriate approach to a decision maker? What are some of the landmines to avoid? Maybe I asked the wrong question. John, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. How would you guide someone in crafting an appropriate, thoughtful, inoffensive approach to a decision maker? And you may be asking the wrong guy because I've been told that I can be quite inappropriate <laughs> at times, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think I go back to the to the transparency. Um, I th think that is a requirement, and then also an understanding of the the problem they're solving, potentially my issue. Um, if uh, if someone's telling me my baby's ugly, um, I'm going to appreciate that um, over time. If they're coming to me and telling me something that's broken. And it's a difficult conversation, but it's one that they're coming to me in a more direct manner as an educator, as a uh, subject matter expert, and not skirting around it, but hitting it dead on in a, in a way that uh, is respectful, but also can potentially become uncomfortable. Um, the way they handle that is important. And I think approaching it with transparency and really approaching it from the point of view as an educator. Um, if, if I see that, then I will be receptive to that message, regardless of how difficult the, the, the input might be, or the problem that they're pointing out or telling me my, my baby's ugly as they call it. All right. Sharon, should I repeat the question or? I, I have, I've been almost dreading, uh, sharing my feedback here and, and I'll focus more on assuming that this is a, a cold call type of approach. I, I go to really great lengths to block all forms of communication that I'm not interested in. So <clears throat> for example, I use Outlook focused inbox. So anyone that I've not whitelisted goes to the other box and I don't read that. Uh, anything unsolicited, I typically don't read and automatically send a junk mail so that I don't see it in any future occasion. Um, I have not set up voicemail on, um, on my phone because in the past I received so many unsolicited cold calls that my voicemail fills up. And so I just don't set it up anymore. I did try at one point to have a separate phone number that that vendors could be directed to, but it I I just ended up not maintaining it. And so I while there may be wonderful, thoughtful, well-crafted email, my the way I manage it is that I I never see those. And so it kind of gets back to the question and something that John hit on earlier was how, how do you um, engage? And I love John, what you said about being involved in the community, in the technology organizations, 
identifying groups that you're passionate about or that your perspective um, um, partners are interested in and you know becoming an, an active participant in those groups. It's a tough one to navigate. What's that? Uh, it's a tough one to navigate. Uh, let's say you're you're in something where altruism is sort of the expectation. You're there to help a cause, serve a purpose. Um, and I go, hey, Sharon, can I talk to you about my wonderful services that I'd love to talk to you about? You know, oh yeah, and this stuff's great too. We're helping the. It, you can come across very poorly, and you can actually damage a relationship if not done properly. But um, I think Don and I, Don Estelle and I, we need to get together and write a book called who's going to pay for all this altruism, because I do think you have to, you have to have that. I mean, we're, we are talking business. So I think business is okay, um, to, to discuss, but it has to be done with such care. And if you're in an, in one of those, um, uh, community involvement type scenarios, don't, don't come across as, Hey, let's sell you some stuff. Don't be that person. Well, I think it's important too, from my experience, um, we have to understand the buyer, right? We have to understand our audience, but we also have to have that support internally from our, from our own organization, because we're, you know, as I listen to what each of you guys have shared, there's, you know, I'm hearing a lot of commonalities between how you like to be approached, how you like to be engaged and, um, but I think it's important too for all organizations to really listen to our customers and our prospective clients and support our, our sales reps and our marketing efforts to really speak to those buyers. Because a lot of times we can sit here and say, it sounds good. This is kind of kumbaya, but then we've got the sales manager standing over the shoulder saying, make the calls, make the dials. And it's like, well, it's going to Sharon that didn't have her voicemail set up. So I can just, you know, um, so, Tom, last but not least, uh, the inoffensive, appropriate approach. Yeah, yeah you know, and I, I, I kind of hate this day and age of, of Zoom calls. I mean, things like this are good, but, but the end networking opportunities are, are the best where you can kind of have a meaningful dialogue. But a lot of what Sharon was saying is yeah, receiving a lot of emails that say, hey, Tom, are you available too today? Let's, let's talk. You know, no qualification, nothing, you know, and I mean, those, those do go, they get deleted. I'm like, sure, and have some, some, some things to look at, but for humor's sake, sometimes I go look at junk email and, um, and review that, but, but I think, you know, someone coming in and assuming they know in, in the first meeting or first email exchange or dialogue that they, they understand my business. And the specific challenges I have, like Donald saying, "Come in, and shoot, we're the best." You know, let's let's start. We've got all these great great solutions for you, but but a more strategic approach is the least offensive in, in my in my book. I mean, come in, listen to me, then come back with a solution, and let me engage with you after I know you you've listened. Um, you know, and I think you know LinkedIn is very beneficial. I'm a firm LinkedIn believer for networking. I do dislike how lately, you know, it's really gone to an email marketing solicitation approach, um, and those don't get read. But I, I did receive one one last year, last April, I think it was about mid-April. Said, "Hey, I hope your 2020 is off to a great start." And uh, <laughs> it's like the worst, you know, worst start to a year in forever, right? And it was just think before you type your email, read it back to yourself. Or your communication, or if you're about to get on a conference call, think through about what you're going to talk to the buyer about. Yeah. You know, make sure you are setting yourself up to be not offensive and, and appropriate to their needs and appropriate and respectful of time. Um, you know, so I mean, so many times I'm sure we've all jumped off calls and like, what was that? You know, that that's the wrong wrong approach. So, you know, that that that's my quick feedback on that. A really, really good question, though, and something to think about for especially younger, less experienced marketers and, and sales professionals. Yeah, I think there's a real opportunity just in here and, you know, what, what you guys have each shared. Um, it's probably not that hard to set ourselves apart in a really, really good way. 
with all the noise that's out there, especially the LinkedIn and all the unsolicited emails uh, that I get that go to my spam, I can't, I can think of one or two that really stick out that grab my attention. And so if, if you're listening here on this call, do some unique things that we've heard today that can really set you apart. Um, because I guarantee you there's not a lot of people doing it. So, um, Lauren, I know we got a lot of stuff going on in chat here, so I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet and let's get some of these questions from the audience. Great. Yeah, we've had a lot of good questions come in, both through the Q&A and the chat. So I'm going to start with the Q&A, um, just to kind of springboard off the question that our panelists just answered, where we would discuss the landmines that everyone should avoid. Um, does anyone have a, an example of a cold call email that you may have received in the past 90 days or so that is an example of a great approach that you'd be willing to share with the rest of the attendees, something that inspired you to get back in touch with someone, even though it was a cold call approach. I really can't think of any that, that said it, you know, that really made me engage from a, a cold call email. Um, I, I will say the best, the best emails or the best approaches are ones that allow me to engage when I'm ready or if there's information shared in that email right then, as opposed to, you know, waiting for a, a meeting or something. So I can get a little bit better background. I mean, th those are better. So something with an attachment that is meaningful, that, that does get through to me, um, yeah. I find more yeah. valuable. I, I hope that helped. I hope that, that answer helped. One, one thing I can suggest that, that has worked is uh, referrals from <clears throat> someone that, that, that I respect. Um, so, you know, just as an example, if, if one of my peers contacts me and, and says, hey, this, this vendor partner has been really great, um, a great partner, uh, I'd love to introduce you. Um, I think that referral type approach is um, much better from my perspective. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Too. Really, really good point. The referral where it's someone um, that, that makes a connection. And usually I prefer an introduction from that person if someone's using their name. So that, that's always a little bit more, a warmer handoff and one I'm willing to, to engage with. Great, and we do have a couple of questions related to that specific topic. Um, basically, uh, a couple people have asked if, if there's a way to get in touch with the decision maker without an introduction. We have a couple people commenting that they have a very high success rate once they are able to make that connection with the decision maker, um, but they understand that maybe they don't have the right connection to start out with, or it's a little difficult to get some time on someone's calendar without the introduction email. So any tips on how to get around that? I'm going to be a bit of a, Tom, go ahead. I was just going to say that that's tough. Uh, one approach I like uh, that someone actually was enabled me to engage with them was just the old fashioned letter, um, postcard. So that, that was different, something landing on my desk. Uh, as opposed to my inbox. I found that um, a much better approach. Sorry, John, go ahead. Well, I'm gonna be a little bit of a beating a dead horse on the community involvement piece, but um, one of the things that I've seen, we, we, I'll give you an example. We, uh, I'm a member of the Emerging Leader in Technology and Engineering or ELITE program. Think of it as a mini MBA program for, for up and coming uh, superstars in the, in the IT world. It's part of the NTC. Um, it's a great program. And one of the things that we saw was a, a CIO that was impossible to get into a room showed up to every one of the events. And the reason why was we were solving a problem that CIO had, it was a workforce development problem. Um, and this particular CIO had a, an emerging leader that they really didn't have the budget to invest in them. There really wasn't a whole lot of options for the leadership uh, uh, programs around town because this person was an IT person. They were introverted. They really didn't want to go to some of the 
the leadership programs that are that were out there, and there really wasn't one available for IT people specifically. And so when this particular CIO that you couldn't get into a room saw this this problem being solved with this organization, uh, that CIO was in every meeting. And so the ability to get close to that person, I watched as our vendor partners that were the sponsors for the event were able to walk right up or that person walked up to them that you could otherwise not get in a room. So uh, again, it kind of kind of beating a dead horse on the community involvement pro process, but as far as making an investment in something that will get you close to a decision maker in a way where you're not just you know, some schlep trying to get in the door, I think is uh, something that I keep going back to, whether I'm looking for partners or whether I'm looking for clients. Yeah, I, I can add on to that, John. I have a example and I'll, I'll use Rob Wilson as this, the example because he was the one that convinced me to join today's talk. So I was attending the Nashville Analytics Summit um, put on by the NTC and I was attending a session and sat next to Rob. And he, um, he had one of the new Microsoft Surface laptops. And so I started the conversation with him and asked him how he liked it and to give me feedback if it's something that I should buy or not. And so you know, that, that was what made the connection there. Now, he hasn't sold me anything. And maybe the opportunity hasn't been right. But you know, it, it was that connection. Um, and, and at least um, when I think about the services that Rob's organization offers, he's, he's in a top box or, you know, he's one of the first people that I think of. That's great feedback. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got another question that came in through the question and answer function um, specific to interviewing in a virtual setting. So can any of our panelists give some tips for a first time candidate, specifically for a managerial role to win an interview in a virtual setting as opposed to a normal in-person kind of setting? Lauren, are we talking about like a job interview or? Yes. Let's see, rephrase that one more time, sorry. Good, the question is, can you give some tips for a first time candidate for managerial positions to win an interview in a virtual setting as opposed to an in-person setting that we would typically go through? Let me grab that one. Um, one of the things that I think would be beneficial is uh, visual aid. I think where poorly done, I've seen it derail meetings, but where properly done, I've seen it be a great way to break up the monotony of just staring at someone's face. Um, that could be, you know, potentially if there's pieces of the job description where you're showing um, results from past experiences, past roles that you've had, if there's a way to, to visualize that, throw that up in a screen share, pop back and forth, that, that creates a certain dynamic piece that whether you're selling a product or yourself or uh, anything, I think that that helps in a way that I've seen really be beneficial. And I see people getting better at it because of COVID, because of virtual requirements. Um, and the ones that do that well get my attention. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think visual, visualization in this day and age is really key um, because you, you don't have an opportunity to kind of have that warped in an in, in-person meeting because of COVID right now. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be getting back to that in some, some way, shape, or form within this year. But I think a way to visualize and, and help tell your story any way you can do that is, is important. And uniqueness, we mentioned it earlier, being unique and, and innovative is a different, you know, to differentiate yourself, whether it's an interview or a sales process or whatever it may be, is, uh, is vitally important and, and showing how you're just that unique. And in a job interview, you're that unique opportunity. You're that unique uh, person that they need to make an investment in. I would like to add one thing. 
So I'm assuming that you already have the interview and you're just asking about how, the difference between what you would do in person virtu versus virtual. And what I would reiterate is, is do the same thing that you would do for an in-person interview. So make sure you dress up, make sure that you arrive early, make sure that all your technology works, be prepared, anticipate questions, have you know, your prepared story. Don't let a virtual meeting feel less formal by any means. Great, thank you all. Um, we just had another question come in, um, kind of back to the sales approach side of things. They ask how many reach out attempts before someone becomes annoying or you end up thinking, oh no, not this person again. Um, and I would add, especially in a virtual context. So is that a numeric question? I think it is. Uh, properly done, they can, they can keep sending me stuff. Improperly done, you know, two is too many. Um, the one thing I will say that I, I cannot stand uh, that I get pretty frequently is the, uh, the, the people that don't understand the tone of their email, especially the third email where they go, well, you haven't gotten back to me. So I guess we were, you haven't explained what, why I should speak to you in the first place. And I'm getting the third or fourth email that has attitude that I haven't gotten back to you. Tom and Sharon, you, you guys may have uh, seen some of those, but those can't stand those. Uh, that will put me off pretty, pretty quickly. That pet peeve of mine is you haven't got back to me. Well, usually it's, it, it's a, there's a reason why. You haven't given me a reason. Yeah. You, 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 you haven't, I don't need, need your solution. Um, your first email maybe didn't even explain really where your solution was clearly, but if you're going to have that attitude in the third or fourth email, I, I can, can just about guarantee, you know, my impression is that you know, your organization will probably be hard to work with if you're representing them. No. And, and you already know my approach. So once I received the first unsolicited email, it went to junk mail and every, every future email is blocked. So um, and unfortunately, I know that's, that doesn't make it any easier to hear that. Um, but to, to think empathetically, you know, in, in a week's time, if I'm contacted 50, 100 times, it's just not manageable. And so there's got to be a, a different way or a different approach that's used. I'll also give more time and attention to someone to go back to the education part. If someone's sending me something that is valuable education, they can keep sending me stuff. Uh, that could be white papers to Sharon's earlier point, Gartner downloads that, that help educate me. Um, anything that, that's great articles, um, you can keep hitting me up and, and ask, asking for my time in that as well, as long as you're giving me something in that transaction. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's the same. You know, if you if you share something in kind of that first email that's meaningful to me to educate me, uh, maybe help me in 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 my industry or what we're focused on, then I you know I'm more willing to consider talking to you. And you just don't see that. You know, you just don't you know get get that level of information very much. Uh, but but those emails that that start you know immediately hey we've got a solution for you let's talk at two o'clock on tuesday well no. <laughs> it's uh you know i'm not going to take a meeting just from an email and two sentences in i think one of the most valuable things we can do is go to our existing customers so if i'm a sales rep I'm trying to break into new markets is sit down and interview my existing clients. And I used to call it an autopsy, but I, I call it just more of an intake of saying, you know, 10 best customers, you know, 
what was it about our service? Uh, what do we do that you can't live without? Um, what are some things that we do that make us that indispensable partner? So I'm always wanting to learn from them because that's helping me craft who I need to be spending more time with. And that gets me focused from a selling perspective too um, on what's important to them because it's probably more, it's probably gonna be important to somebody else, especially if I'm going after the same types of clients. Um, so that's something I don't see a lot of sales reps or organizations doing, interviewing existing customers to help them get better. Great. Yeah, so we're just under the last 10 minutes of today's session. So I wanna end on a question that was submitted through the chat. Um, the person asked, how much receptivity would you have to have for a new solution that you didn't think you needed already? Um, especially if this new solution would require an incremental budget allocation or reallocation of existing funds. So I know this is a big topic um, after last year for, for a lot of different companies. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a hard one, I mean, because if it's a solution we haven't identified as, as needing, it's got to be something that really just jumps out and, and enables us to have that, that understanding why we need it. You know, it's uh, usually, I, I would probably, and Sharon and John, I mean, you guys probably will agree. I mean, if, if you're not looking for something, it specifically, you're not going to be willing to probably probably take a meeting or have a conversation with someone about something that you hadn't even thought about um i mean we're so defined in what we need that we we pretty much know from you know as we enter the year these are strategic initiatives and our objectives so we're going to set out to find solutions for that for those and then when we engage with a, a sales rep that has those solutions um that's when the, we're really you know the, the receptivity takes hold for us you know at that point and uh and again it's kind of doing our due, due, due diligence it's hard to uh find a solution you know it's hard for me to to think through someone presenting something to me we haven't thought about not to say that, that that wouldn't happen we're not perfect but it would just have to be so groundbreaking and and, and earth-shattering we would would be able to uh that'd be like wow we didn't think about that don't know if that answered the question, but that, that's a hard one to answer. It, it is hard. And, and something you said, Tom, struck a chord with me in that, um, you know, it, it potentially is, um, it, it is better to engage with the company's formal budget planning process. Um, all of the organizations <laughs> where I've worked with as a kind of decision maker responsible for a budget, it's a very formalized process. Um, you know, typically you have third quarter where you're working on what your budget will be the next year. And um, most organizations aren't very open to kind of the ad hoc uh, expenditure with, with a couple of exceptions. So, you know, one, one area, where I feel we're always constrained and we have a crisis right now in technology, I believe is with, um, with staffing and qualified help. And so, you know, that, that's always a challenge as potentially unplanned projects come up, new business opportunities to try to figure out how to complete the existing work and the new work instead of having to prioritize, uh, deprioritize some work. Well, great. We're coming up on the last couple of minutes. So unless there's any other uh, topics that want to come in through the chat, I think we're okay to wrap up for today. Um, thank you so much to Craig for being our moderator, to Tom, John, and Sharon for sharing, sharing all of your uh, insights on today's topic of discussion. I think this has been great. And uh, we'll get this uploaded so that everyone can access the recording later on. But thank you for attending today. Thank great you. job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.